Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Friends, welcome to the Encounter program sponsored by the Broome County Council of Churches. I'm your host, Mark Kimpland, and I'm the pastor at the Endwell United Methodist Church. I am so very excited about our program today because the human spirit is amazing. It allows us to enjoy life, to feel life, its pain and its joys. And we're going to be talking uh, with someone today who knows a little bit about the human spirit. And uh, I've, I'm so glad that our guest was able to be with us. Uh, we've been working on getting together now for several weeks. And I'd like to welcome to the show uh, my sister, uh, Lisa Anoni, uh, who comes uh, uh, to the Encounter program this week. And Lisa uh, is a recipient of a double lung transplant. And I've asked her to come on board here on the Encounter program and to kind of share her story um, from kind of beginning to end. So Lisa, welcome to the Encounter program. I'm Thank so glad you. that you are here. Thank you for having me and inviting here. me. Absolutely. You have, a, you have an amazing story, a uh, story about the human spirit, um, the human body, um, yeah. um, all kinds of things that I'd like to uh, take our listeners and viewers through today. Sure. But first, as we kind of launch in, in, into this time together that we have, can you tell our uh, viewers and listeners a little bit about your background, your history, just so they can kind of connect with you? Uh, uh, tell us a little bit about Lisa growing up, where you might have gone to school, sure. a little bit of your history. Um, my name is Lisa Inoni. I was born and raised in Endicott, New York. Um, went to UE School District, so George W. Johnson was my elementary school, mm -hmm. Jenny F. Snap, and then UE High School. Awesome. Um, and I've been in the area ever since. Um, most of my family's here. So uh, it's, it's been a really great place to grow up. I have a lot of good friends and family awesome. in the area. So this is home. This is home, this yes. This is home it and, is. Has, and it has been, good. Yeah. Now what did you do after high school and such things? Did you? So um, after high school, um, I went on to college at Ithaca and then Broome Community College. Okay. And then I started working full time in the area. Mm -hmm. So um, I was doing retail and um, working at a cosmetic counter, managing it okay, okay. in a retail Wonderful. setting. So. And then something happened. Yes. <laughs> Life happened in a very profound, scary, yeah. uh, very Things unusual Things started moving way. a lot quicker. Okay. Um, I just began becoming like very short of breath with exertion of any type. And so that didn't seem normal. And then I began passing out. and. So I went to a local doctor, and after quite a few like misdiagnosis and some ideas, um, I was asked to see someone like a specialist mm -hmm. in pulmonary, um, the pulmonary field. So I ended up at um, New York Presbyterian Hospital mm -hmm. in New York City and Columbia, and um, Dr. Erica Berman was the specialist I saw. And then she would take care of me for the next 10 years, um, keeping me alive yeah. uh, through several different medicines and, you know, procedures. So uh, up to, so let, let's talk about 10, 12 years ago, up to that sure. point, life was very normal. Life was then. totally normal. Okay. Um, like for an everyday kid, like yeah. just, um, you know, I was busy doing all the things that kids do. I was never super like overly athletic or um, you know into running and yeah but yeah, I yeah. don't know if that had anything to do with it or not but yeah, yeah everything was fine everything was good uh, my so health was good yes you know um, mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't notice anything I never like mentioned anything about it or so what. symptoms appeared and life became much more difficult now sure, you find yourself your world gets flipped upside oh down oh my goodness I, I, and yeah. um you're being told we have to do something we have to do something fast um because this has progressed quite far you're in stages that are high and um 
if we don't do something, this disease is progressive and it's fatal and you won't be here with us. So we can prolong your life with these medications, um, but we really can't tell you how long you have. Yes. So that was a lot. Yes. You know, it was a lot for me, it was a lot for my family. And now you really didn't have much time to start making big decisions. Yes. Yeah. So I wanted to live. And um, there was no doubt about that. And so I said, let's do what we have to do. And so immediately we were, I was put into surgery and they placed a pump in my, through my chest that was an IV line. And that pump and the medicine it um, carried throughout my body kept me alive. Okay. And that worked for, along with certain medications, for that whole, for those years um, leading up to transplant. So that was a number of years then that you had I that I lived pump with and, yes, an IV, yes. constant IV, sleeping, you know, shower, um, awake and around. I mean, we never, we were one in the same. Yeah. Um, yes. It was my best friend and my worst enemy. Sure. I hated and loved it. Yes. Like, loved yes. it. Yeah. Yeah. So the symptoms appear and then you're trying to find answers and right. then it's medication and then it's the pump and then, sure. um, that, which is actually keeping you alive, sure. which is keeping you. And the hate part of that was the side effects and, mm -hmm. you know, any medication that's that strong has bad things that come with it, as long with, with, with the good. And so um, then we got to this point where that wasn't enough anymore. Okay. And scarier things were happening uh, physically with me. Yeah. And so now I was on oxygen and I was still mobile, but I was had a tank. So now I was carrying a tank of oxygen with me everywhere I went and I had a nose cannula. And um, so now I visibly looked sick to people. Sure. Um, so now like people who didn't realize were like, oh wow, you're sick. Yes, <laughs> and yes, um, yes. so then it was the time, like my doctor started saying, now is the time we need to like, we have this window of opportunity, she called it. And this is where we do all the work up. We had been doing some, mm -hmm. but we start all the work up for you to become like eligible to be on the transplant list. Okay. And I did not know what I had signed up for. <laughs> okay. um, I did, but I didn't. Okay. okay. So um, that was a series of just testing and testing. And, um, you know, I'm not going to go into all of it, but it just, you don't realize until you go through something like that, all the bases that have to be covered mm. before you can even be considered. To even be on the list then. Yes. Sure. Yeah. And so that is emotionally and physically trying as well. Yes. Um, you know, you psych yourself out and um, it's it's scary. Yeah. But you're still yeah. like, I just wanted to live. Yes. So I would throw that to the back, the, the fear. And whatever I could do, I would move forward and just try to live life the fullest I could because I didn't know when it was ending mm -hmm. and just move forward. Now, when you had the pump and such things, and mm -hmm. that was keeping you alive, yes. was the hope that that would do it for you, or, or did you, that go in knowing that eventually you'll probably need a transplant? They were very honest with me. My doctor was very honest Wonderful. with me. My hope was yeah. <laughs> that the pump was going to help me live forever, yes. and I would never need anything past that. Okay. Um, but it had been very well laid out for me that eventually, because this disease is progressive, you'll reach a point where this is not enough anymore. But that is not hopeless. We have a next step for you. And that was what was so promising about my doctor was that she never let me feel hopeless. She always had the next step for me, um, whether I liked it or not. Yes. But she had um, an idea. Right. You know, and yes. she was like, we can do this. You can do this. Yeah. Even when I was like, I can't do this. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, how important you know, that is. Yes, very much so. Yeah. Um, and to always have that hope, and that came through her and the medicine and my friends and family. And mm -hmm. you know. did you find at times throughout that that you lost the hope? There were times I remember saying like, 
asking myself, why am I still here? Yes. Um, what's my purpose of being here now? Yes. Because when you are limited, which really looking back, I still could do so much. But when your life becomes altered the way that it had, you start asking yourself those questions. And sometimes you don't want to let other people around you know you're asking yourself those sure, questions sure. because you can feel guilty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but I did. I, I asked myself a lot and some of my closest friends like, why am I still here? Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. but then there was always a part of me that had this fire that was like, there is a reason you're still here yeah. and you need to use that, yes. that reason you're still here and, and give back yes. and yeah. teach people about this disease yeah. and don't stop talking about it and keep living as much as you can until the, your last day, whenever that is. Right. None of us know when our Absolutely. last day is, Absolutely. whether we're sick or healthy. Yes. So it's like, yeah. you just need to keep living. Yeah. You just need to live your most like <laughs> full life you possibly can. Amen. Yes, yeah. It, it's, a, it's amazing how hope can, can take different facets and look differently at different times and the human yeah. spirit wrestles with itself, but um, at different times and different places in life, it, it, mm -hmm. it's amazing. It is. Friends, I, I'm here. I, I'm blessed to be here on the on the Encounter program with Lisa uh, Anoni, and uh, she, again, she is a double lung transplant recipient. And so you find yourself um, at the point where countless tests and just uh, you know that the big step is coming. is coming. Mm -hmm. It's coming down the down the pike and such things. Kind of take me through that uh, from that point on. Then, so a lot of these tests, you're going back and forth. You're so my life really became <coughs> travel. Mm. travel for doctor's appointments yes. and that really does not that gets old fast mm. so um we tried to make the best of it so i was constantly in new york city and philadelphia those two cities are incredible <laughs> um even if you're not in the hospital uh so we would see the sites in between the appointments mm. so i would eat several cheesesteaks when we got to philly and we would see, you know, the monuments and yes. take the walks and see what the city really had to offer. And, you know, the city of brotherly love mm -hmm. and get to know the people. And um, I really realized how beautiful a city it mm -hmm. is. I really hadn't spent much time there. Yeah. Um, New York City is like yeah. my favorite. Uh -huh. um, I spent more time there, so yes. I got to know it better. And um, just the life that is there flowing through those streets is like a metaphor for what I was going through and just wanted to live. And so <clears throat> there was so much life going on there that it just made me want to keep living yeah, yeah. and survive yes. um, and thrive yeah. and uh, see everything I could. So and that's really a unique opportunity through that time leading up to the transplant that you might not have ever otherwise had then. Sure. Okay. And, you know, I didn't always love driving down there. Absolutely. I'd be like, oh, again. <laughs> but then I'd get there and I'd be like, I'm, I'm so glad I'm here, you know, yes. and I felt safe there mm -hmm. because I knew they knew how to care for me there. Yes. You know, I was kind of like this random weird patient mm -hmm. here and um because it is such a rare disease yeah. so being somewhere where people were like oh yeah we know that disease it was like oh, yes Good. thank yes. you you know yes. and yes. um it was there was a lot of hope there okay too. okay so eventually then you go through all the tests and yes. you you know that what kind of what is inevitable um mm -hmm. can you take us back to when you finally got the word that uh it's it's go time it, it, it it's time or sure. at least close to that time that so i got really ill and i had to be hospitalized my doctor said you have to be hospitalized you can't be just out like yeah. anymore so i i entered new york presbyterian and i was there for quite a while um on a floor living you know yeah. in a room but then um, it was time like it got really bad. I was on high flow oxygen. I had to go on ECMO, mm -hmm. which is in really easy terms, um, cycles your blood so that you're getting the oxygen you need in your blood to live. It's, it's life sustaining machine. Okay. Okay. So now I'm on life support. Yeah. And not everyone is awake for that, but I was. So, uh, yeah. I was awake, but not very mobile. Okay. Um, okay. But 
the point was they wanted to keep me mobile because mm. You want to be as active as you can leading up to transplant yes. so that it goes well and then afterward you're able to still be active. Yes. So um, that time was really trying. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I had this incredible staff that was like parading me literally through the halls because I was hooked up. So there was like a parade of like five nurses yes. everywhere I went. I yes. felt very... Yeah. Very important. VIP coming. Everyone through. kind of stopped and looked when I'd walk by, and um, <laughs> I was kind of VIP in the hospital, yes. Um, and you know, the care was incredible, and I knew it was we were getting close. Um, and you know, my doctor was checking in on me, and um, then talk about how you work up the list. So I really wasn't that high up on the list to receive the transplant, even though I was really bad, because I was still walking uh, and I was still awake and okay. coherent. So as much as I needed the lungs, mm. it didn't, that wasn't um, mm. necessarily visibly seen on the yes. list. Yes, okay. So, um, yeah. That was when my doctor reached out to Philly, which I had been going there, so right. they knew me. And, right. and she said, you know, like, we're gonna need you guys, like, as backup here, because she's not, she's, nothing is coming available. Yes, yes.